Ladies and gentlemen, today I am super excited to announce a new format of a chess event that is being championed and pioneered and driven by Magnus Carlsen. This event is called Freestyle Chess. For the word freestyle has absolutely zero relevance, but that's its name. And essentially, this is an eight-player event, which is a mix of rapid chess and classical chess, with a couple of twists. Number one, it is an invitation-only event. So basically, Magnus partnered with uh, this, uh, this resort uh, in Germany to put on this event, and they invited a bunch of players. There's no Hikaru, who might have declined. I'm not sure. There's no Wesley So, but there's Fabiano Caruana, there's Levon Aronian, Nodirbek Abdusaturov, uh, and I'm going to forget some names right now, so I'm not going to name the rest, but even Dingley Ren is playing the current world champion. And uh, it begins today. It's a mix of different formats, rapid and, uh, and also classical chess, and it's Fisher Random. So it's Chess 960, meaning the games have no openings. There are no opening repertoires involved, which means the games are absolute madness. As you can see, this is, this is the setup. The only rules, and the reason it's called 960, is because the king has to be between the two rooks, so you can castle a certain direction, or you can castle that way, and the bishops have to be an opposite color. Otherwise, you can shift everything around. So Magnus got his wish. Magnus got a chess tournament with a unique format, a mix of time controls, and a knockout. So they basically tailor-made this tournament around Magnus. Okay, great. So here are the stages. In the first stage, it's a round robin. Everybody plays everybody, and then everybody gets seeded into a knockout. So this is day one, and the very first move of this game is castles. <laughs> Why? Because this rook is used for castling short, and this rook is used for castling long. Very funny. So that rook would need to be over here to free up the space. Anyway, both sides castle. <laughs> so Magnus and Firuja both castle their kings on the first move. And the incredible thing about Fisher Random as they begin this game is like, there's just no openings, right? So you have to open up your diagonals of queen and bishop. We have take, take, they get their knights out. And then they play these like, weird pawn moves that sort of block the diagonals up away from each other. And, and Magnus plays this very slow maneuvering game. Magnus in general stays away from making too many pawn moves because he doesn't like to make too many weaknesses. Ali Reza brings his bishops to the, to the side of the board to a5 and a6, and then they trade. And Magnus starts doing his usual thing. This kind of looks like a regular game of chess now, except for some reason the queen is here. The knights are sort of squiggly. And if white plays d5, white's going to have dominant control over the light square. So Ali Reza plays bishop a6, Magnus advances his pawns, and Ali Reza tries to fight back. Take, take, knight f5. And slowly, Magnus builds up a very, very powerful initiative with this move d5. He's got the same amount of pawns, but he's got a pawn that's three squares away from queening. He's promoted. Uh, he's made a pass pawn, rather, but Ali Reza sharp with it. Knight to d6. Queen hanging, queen hanging, knight hanging. Take. Rook f1, we trade, and we go to this endgame with knight e7. Passive defense by Ali Reza. Magnus turning the pressure, applying the... But he's, he doesn't have a way forward, and now we're here. All of a sudden, Ali Reza is, uh, is, is, is in, in cruise control with the pass pawn. The pawn's marching down the board. Both guys have 30 seconds on the clock in this rapid game, and Ali Reza glues Magnus's uh, king to the last rank. Look at this position. Magnus can't move. Because if he plays knight e3, king c1, he's completely stuck. The knight has to stay there. And then Ali Reza is going to try to get his knight to c3 and maybe win the game. But in that time, these pawns are going to go. So it's sort of an unstoppable force meets an immovable object situation where Magnus is not going to leave Ali Reza's pawn, but Ali Reza can't stray too far either. So Ali Reza keeps trying. Magnus has pawns on both sides of the board, so he's very close to winning. But Ali Reza still with chances. Knight to d4 check is winning maybe. So he plays knight f2, knight, and now and now the pawns go, both sides with one pawn each. And now Magnus basically says, you know what? I'm going to go march my king. We're going to trade everything down, and we're going to make a draw. It's so funny in these games, you can castle each. You can both castle. So this is a, a brand new type of format. Uh, every one of these positions is unique. We've got some great Magnus games. Players are on fire all over the place. Let's keep moving right along. The incredible thing about Fisher Random is that, again, the king is between the rooks, but last game there was a queen there, right? This is just one of these positions. 
So early on in this game, something completely happened, uh, something completely insane happened between Levon and Nodjerbek. Uh, check this out, y'all. E4, knight d2, and in this position, Nodjerbek Abdusatorov sacked his bishop. What? Yeah, because there's no way to guard the king. So Levon goes here. What? He's just, his king is on the edge of the board, but there's no way to mate him. You can play queen h6, and then you can play queen g5, and now the king walks all the way to e2. He goes boop, 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 and now he's safe. But because the king is so weak, Nodjerbek just keeps attacking, brings his bishop in, plays rook f7, and black is better. You notice rook g1 was played. If you take my queen, this is mate. If you take my queen, this is literally mate. I mean, chess 960 Fisher random is so goofy. It leads to some completely wild positions, and all opening preparation is at home. Openings don't matter anymore. In many ways, you can even crown the best player in the world like this. Look at this. Bro's king went on a spiritual walk. 97. The bishops come out. It's a completely insane game. Nodjerbek is still a piece down, by the way. And, and, and Levon is just trying to trade off some pieces and kind of extinguish the initiative. Look at d5. D5 on the board, just trying to open the board as much as you can, because white is sort of stuck. Rook D8, King C2, the king is running around now. Finally, finally, white has consolidated, and he's doing very well, but he's only got a minute. Queen B7, bishop back to F6. Levon is a piece up, but Nodjerbek is not, he's not, he won't stop. He won't stop attacking. He only has one pawn. Nodjerbek has six pawns versus five. He's down a full piece, and yet his attack is roaring forward. And it actually manages to break through. Queen e7. E3, but wait a minute. But wait a minute. Levon. Levon doing his job. Levon, look at this. Queen d3, nice and solid. And then here, Nodjerbek uncorks a rook sacrifice. The attack is never over. King to f8. Nodjerbek is down a full rook, but knight b4 is on the way with queen e4 coming. But bishop a3, now you can't move the knight there. Rook b8. And now if... Levon just goes for it, he wins, but he doesn't, he hesitates, he plays defensively, and all of a sudden, Nodjerbek is back in the- What is going on? Nodjerbek has just three pawns that are gonna storm down the board. King e6, king d5, what it? Levon can't move any pieces, oh my god. Ruchi, oh my god, Levon's giving up a piece. He's giving up everything. Is Levon losing? I think he might be, but when the dust settles, it's king, rook, and knight versus king and rook. And this is just a draw. So they play 40 more moves, and then they make a draw. I mean, 100 moves. They played 100 moves. What even was this game? He sacrificed. This is, this is what we're talking about. I mean, this is the real stuff right here. This really shows who's got the best nerves and who's the best chess player. Look at this complete madness of a game. This is really what we want, you know, chess on television. Of course, the purists, the traditionalists, they're not going to be happy. They're not going to be happy. This is, this is goofy chess. This is circus chess. Uh, but, uh, I mean, the games were just absolutely all over the place. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep the starting position here just so you can see. This is a brand new starting position. This is Gukesh versus Magnus Carlsen. This one starts with a bird, f4. For, for white to castle, white needs the rook there. So you would need to move the queen and the bishop. And to castle that way, you're gonna need to move all four pieces. So that's the way you would castle. c6, and both guys begin developing their pieces. Okay, now white can't castle that way. Knight d6, and I mean, there's just no openings, right? There's no openings. Magnus has the sniper bishop. He has a strong structure, and then he starts, look at that g5 move. You can't take with a knight because I would take your rook. If you take with a pawn, that's fine, but I'm going to activate my pieces, right? Magnus plays bishop f7, and then here you talk about a psychological blow. Boink! This dude is teleporting off the map, and now the king's on the opposite side of the board. Now you're like, oh my god. And let's not forget, white can't castle. White can't castle short. The only way white can castle is long side, which would be queen here. And now white could potentially do this. <laughs> which is nuts, because why would you castle into an attack? So I don't, I don't know what Gukesh is going to do. Clearly, Magnus has planned this out very well, where Gukesh is either going to have to sit here and get mated or castle and get mated. What is he going to do? He starts fighting back. E5. And then he takes on e6, removing this. 
plays queen b3, but Magnus is taking over the game. Magnus has clearly understood the position a bit better than Gukesh, and he's got a very powerful position. Knight to c5, Gukesh takes. Here comes Magnus, knight to d3, takes on b2. Oh my goodness, Gukesh is king, being hit around like a pinata. Take, take. e6. But now he's Gukesh somehow back in the game. Somehow Magnus has been pushed back into passivity. Knight e5, and he, oh my god, look at this! The hero! Gukesh, clearly a Gotham subscriber, because I always say, when in doubt, run the king to the opposite side of the board. Rook d8 check. He blocks the check with the knight. Oh my god. Magnus is losing control of the game. In fact, Magnus is just worse. Gukesh is threatening knight f6 check, which would pick up the rook. Magnus goes here. Knight e5. Take, take, check. The king just goes right back to the middle. The knight is stuck. The pawns are potentially weak. Rook h6. Magnus still has two-minute advantage on the clock. Gukesh is like can be a little bit nervous with low time he's not a he's not a huge blitz player but look at this he consolidates and there's a pawn in gukesh's territory that is going to make the difference and there it goes and now both guys are at 30 seconds gukesh has evened out the time situation c7 the pawns a score away from queening rook a2 knight d1 what a move what a move stopping the knight and if you take i queen if you take i queen and gukesh consolidates and swarms the black king and is up a piece the most important thing is he's got a pawn remaining because that pawn can become a queen magnus fighting back we're now deep into the uh, 58 we're now deep into the 50 moves rook a7 is mate but if you play bishop b7 i play here bishop c8 knight c5 and then i'm going to win this bishop and you will resign and gukesh beats magnus carlsen in freestyle chess oh my goodness Oh my goodness, we have seen so many positions. We've seen kings over here and queens in the corner. We've seen this position. And sometimes in these in these games, like look, over here, you know, the king is pretty safe. Here the king is kind of like, is it stuck? Is it going to go that way? What's going to happen? Now, one of the craziest storylines of the day, by the way, is Dingley Ren. So Dingley Ren, uh, by the way, this is, uh, I think back to the, the Nordjabek game. You'll remember, it's the exact same position, right? So in that game, you'll remember, uh, maybe you don't, because this is all really confusing. Nodjebek sacrificed the bishop here and brought the king out. This could have happened in this game as well. Ding versus Fabiano. Like right here, uh, Fabi could have played bishop takes pawn. And then it would have been king takes and queen g6 and king f3 and queen g4 and king e3 and queen e4 and king d2. And then you would have taken the knight back. <laughs> uh, but that didn't happen. Instead, we got e6. And this game was very balanced. Uh, it was a complex game, and, and Ding was down in exchange, but it was, it was very complicated, and then it went into an endgame. And Ding had 22 minutes on the clock when he played bishop e5 and hung a bishop. Like, I'm not exaggerating. Ding had a 10-minute time advantage and played this and hung a piece. He was down a pawn, but, I mean... Fabiano did not really have anything impressive going on and, you know, bishop c3, bishop b4, like, yeah, probably black is playing this for some advantage, but they're, and, and Ding just straight up just blundered, like, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know what to say, um, and, um, that was one of the biggest storylines of the day, that Ding played that, then I have a few more games for you, uh, Nodjebek versus Dingli Ren, you might recognize this position from this game, from the Gukesh Magnus game, where Magnus kind of teleported the king the other way. Nodjebek in this game went for a massive center. And Ding played in a very cagey approach. He played very passively. Queen c2. We had opposite side castling. So you know now we're going to get into a big fight. Also bishop e6. Ding sacrificed the pawn to create immediate counterplay. Nodjebek took. Backed up and said. I mean I'm up a pawn right. And then I'm just going to like I'm going to trade the pieces down because I'm a pawn up. Knight f4. We have captures uh, on f4, and then we, we get to this endgame. Big simplification. And this is the endgame, and Nodjebek is still up a pawn. So Ding goes here, Nodjebek defends. He starts bringing his king, and now it's basically a question of, can Nodjebek win a pawn up endgame knight versus bishop? King d3. He's not rushing. Takes. Strong knight. Rook f1 defending, and now he's going to advance. And basically what Nodjebek is trying to do is isolate the advantage. The advantage is there. He doesn't have a pawn advantage on the other side of the board, so he's going to try to isolate that advantage, kind of bide his time. Clearly, it's equal. Uh, and Ding is doing a great job defending himself. Knight f3, solid. Rook h4. Oh, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's maybe something he wanted to avoid. In endgames, you got to be really careful how you're simplifying. 
And now Noidjebek might have a pass pawn advantage. And that might win him the game. And there goes his king. And he's dancing and he's looking for a way. And does he have a way or is this just a defensive set? Ah, that doesn't look very good. Here comes Ding though. Here comes Noidjebek. C6. Noidjebek is very close. And he finds a he, he finds an idea here, but there, there's an even more gangster idea. And the gangster idea is knight takes pawn. And the point is that after this, the bishop cannot stop both pawns. The king is behind the pawn, so you, you can't take me. It's crazy. He misses that. He goes for this. Take, take here. The knight is coming back. Knight d5, and it stops the... Oh, my goodness. And Nojebrek is winning. He's winning king b4, and the pawn is going to go, and it goes, and it goes all the way. And how are you going to win this position? Pretty easy. You just go forward. You allow the queen. It's check, it's check, it's check, it's check, and it's mate. It is mate. Check, 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 check. And in this position, Ding the Ren resigns. Oh my goodness, what an endgame win by Nodjerbeck. Now, we move right along Vincent Keimer who's the grandmaster. This is the very first position that they played, the very first type of setup. Um, this one, Vincent played a very solid setup. Queen takes d5, bishop to d3. Ding went for a pin. He had pressure, uh, but he gave up a pawn early. Ding was playing kind of in a very aggressive way, uh, but uh, you'll notice <laughs> Vincent just has a dead rook. So Fisher Random is super, super clunky and weird. And apparently in this position, Despite being up a rook, white's rooks suck. Like, it's kind of weird how relative P's values exist in Fisher Random. And I'm going to fast forward through this game. Vincent goes on a monster attack. The relative value of black's pieces is way stronger than white's rooks. White's rooks are staring at nothing. And very quickly, Vincent develops a mammoth initiative. Mammoth. All the M's are capitalized. Knight H3. Look at this. You can't take me. If you take me, rook g4, nobody can stop mate. Not a single one of these bozos. Nobody can stop mate. So Ding has to play g3, rook f5, but he is mercilessly attacked by the queen and rook of, of, of Keimer. And in this position, he just resigns. He resigns because he's down a couple of pawns in an endgame. He will lose this, and queen h1 is on the way as well. Ding Liren is 0-3, and Vincent Keimer is 2.5 out of 3. Vincent drew Magnus, beat Nodzirbeck, and he beat Ding Liren. So Vincent Keimer, who's like very, very good, but he's not, you know, he's not top 10 yet. He's like top 15, top 20, maybe top 25. I'm not exactly sure his level. Absolutely crushing it. And I have one more for you, by the way. I mean, I really hate... Um... I really hate to do this, and I, I, I listen, I, I love Ding Liren, but I also love Gukesh a lot, and I gotta, you know, I gotta honor when players have monster performances. Uh, in this game, Gukesh brought his queen out on the edge of the board because there's no knights. See, in chess, you don't really bring your queen out early, except like in the Scandinavian defense, because there's knights, and knights are very scary. But, uh, and, and, and just so you know, like, I, I know we love Magnus, you'll have a Magnus game, I promise. Uh, but you can bring your queen out, because the queen is actually very difficult to target, Bishop takes f6, knight d5, and Gukesh just says, I don't even want my rook. You see, I could have played rook b1, but then you would have went here, and then I couldn't go there because you would have taken. No, he's just, just take it. Rooks aren't worth anything anymore. That's why everybody's sacrificing them. Rooks aren't worth much in Fisher Random because they're so passive. And because the dynamics of the position in a regular chess setup, rooks get to the action relatively quickly, like in 15 moves. But here it takes a while, and, and Ding, obviously, like, half on tilt and half kind of like, I'm going to have to risk it for the biscuit, gives up a pawn, opens up his king, and just starts fighting back. But Gukesh has long-term pressure, and he's just attacking Ding's weaknesses, and it's almost like a field day. I mean, Black just has no play. Look at Black's rooks. Ding is going to have to start getting rid of his rooks. Because just like in the Keimer game, his rooks are not getting in, in, involved. And oh my goodness, he starts fighting. But bishop d5. Look at this beautiful synergy by Gukesh's army. Knight e2, d4, perfect coordination, slowly building up the pressure. And this is hanging, that's hanging, and that's hanging. And I mean, it, it look, and the rook is, by the way, hitting both things. It's just a perfect symphony of peace coordination. And when it all, it's all said and done, it is him just picking up all the pieces. Queen before queen a5, Ding resigns. He resigns because the rook is trapped. 
The rook is literally like you could play rook c8, then I take and I, I I bring a knight in or I bring in a queen. Ding Li Ren lost every game he played today. He went 0-4. That is shocking. Now he's not knocked out. As I said, this is the round robin stage, so basically he would be the eighth seed. Which I imagine comes with some sort of disadvantage, right? Like, otherwise, I don't even know why we're playing Rapid. <laughs> if there's like, if, if everything's the same, you're just the eighth seed and you, I don't know. I really, I'm, I'm not sure. But yeah, Ding did not play his best today. Um, frequently getting stuck with very passive rooks. But you know who did play really well today? Vincent Keimer. Vincent Keimer played very well today. As you can see, this is a, this is a setup we haven't seen yet. So we're probably going to be opening up this bishop. We're going to be trying to blunt that one. And then white is going to decide which way to put the king. So you can't stop a man from playing a London if he wants to play one. Uh, both guys bringing pieces kind of quickly to the game, castling. And now it's just kind of a London, except you're kind of in a dream. You know, like when you're dreaming and you can't really move your limbs, but you can, but you can't. And it's like, that's kind of what we have here. We have a fever. Like, for some reason, we have a bishop here. I... I don't know why, you know, the, the, the king and the rook castled and the bishop had fallen asleep in his bed. They're like, you idiot, wake up. Bishop f5, rook d1. And of course, you know, we're going to build up the position very normally. And there's g3. So here comes the bishop. Very locked position. Very locked. Fabi takes on h1 and then plays h6. And Keimer says, wait a minute. What about g4? g4 and f3. Look at that. Control. It's all about control. And the person in a close position that controls pawn breaks has the advantage. If you control the pawn breaks, you have the advantage. Black does not control the pawn breaks. Therefore, he does not have the advantage. Look at that. Knight c5. He's taking a step forward. h4. A lot of space getting taken. Now Fabiano tries to fight back. Take, take. Look at this move. Queen h2. Dear lord. To bring the rook to pressure the pawn, if the knight moves, you got the sniper bishop. Black is very restricted. He plays take, take, knight d7. Because when you're down space, you want to trade pieces. Fabiano, a very principled man, but Vincent Keimer controls the pawn breaks. Therefore, he has the advantage. E4. He's got a lot of space, but it's a, it's a game where like it, it, it feels like if white makes the wrong pawn move, everything will fall apart. The whole sandcastle. Knight e5. Fabiano seals the door. But now look at this. We have a new front of attack. Bishop e3, I'm going to trade your best piece. And now look at rook b2. I'm just going to double up. I'm either doubling on the b-file or the d-file. You don't know. Rook d8? Oh, no. Psych! I'm going to b7. Rook d7. You can't take me because in Fisher Random, rooks are terrible. Look at that. And believe it or not, according to the computer, the best move is to take. And then to play queen a3 to create counterplay. I don't know how he was supposed to find that. Instead, he went here. And then the space advantage became completely untenable, and now mate is threatened. And unfortunately, Fabiano Caruana resigns as his king is about to get brutalized. Vincent Keimer is winning the tournament. He is winning the tournament after the round robin. Now, again, that doesn't mean anything because they have to play a whole nother section, but he is destroying people. And Magnus only won one game today. He only won one game. So again, same setup. All right, that one became a London, right? So from this setup, you know, Vincent kind of played a London and Magnus played uh, whatever this is, Knight C5. <laughs> Knight C5. Now, I just, I want, I'm going to tell you something right now, which is so wild. So in this position, Levon lost the game. Levon borderline lost the game after the move b5. Advanced computers already state this one move so drastically weakens c5 that white is winning. And the point is, if you play d6 to control c5, I can very quickly play g3 and a4. And actually, it's impossible for black to defend the light squares. If b takes... Even rook a4, something like check, here, take, take. This position is already so weak that black is borderline losing. So Magnus puts his knight on c5. And because now black has to defend the light squares for the rest of the game, he is basically losing from like the second move. Take, take. And black is structurally busted. He can't play d6. 
He's trying to. But this... And the point is crazy. You just can't take the knight. You, you can't do anything. If he had played queen b6, Magnus would have went a4 and a5. Which would have forced Levon to play a5. And then there would have been takes and takes. And I don't know, b4. Like, you, you cannot move your entire queen side because of the way that you played the opening. It's shocking. b5 is already borderline a strategic losing mistake. In chess, you can't lose in two moves unless you really freaking want to. But in this game... Magnus just builds up this positional advantage, and Levon tries to get, you know, tactical. Levon deflects the bishop and takes the knight, but his king is too weak. So he tries to run with the king. Magnus plays d5. And a4. And, and, and Levon's just, he's too stuck. He's too stuck. Like, his king is stuck, all the pieces are on the back rank. Bishop b7, castles, and here comes the rook. And I mean, it, like, again, computer doesn't think this is completely, completely hopeless. But Magnus just won't stop. I mean, for a human being, this is basically hopeless. You can't have four pieces on the back rank while your king is just about to get, you know, massively assaulted. C takes before, and uh, yeah, Magnus doesn't take with the rook. He just takes with the rook. And you can't take because queen d7. King b6, bishop e3. The king is hunted out into the edge of the board. Rook, rook is going to come in. Did, how, how, how did he lose in two moves? Like, how is that even possible? The theory of chess 960 is still being developed, and it's just fascinating how you could play any setup. Like, literally, five or six setups are probably possible from any given position because there's 960 possible starting positions, which means within those, there's probably like 15 different openings. So good luck, is my point. Your standings after the first day of the round robin, Vincent Keimer with three and a half out of four against Dingley Ren, Fabio Nakarawana, Nodjebek Abdusatorov, and Magnus Carlsen. I think that was his four. It might not be Nodjebek, it might be somebody else. Magnus only two. One win, one loss, two draws. Complicated games. Ding, zero. Levon, 0 0.5. Now, this doesn't exactly matter because it's everybody makes the playoffs. But maybe it matters because being an eighth seed is a disadvantage and you don't get to choose your colors later. I, I don't know. Otherwise, I'm... I'm not really sure. Maybe these guys could lose on purpose and try to get a better matchup. Like, would you rather play Magnus? I don't even know. Is Magnus the best at this format? I have no idea. Clearly, it seems to be Vincent. So, this is freestyle chess. This is day one of the round robin. Tomorrow, we will finish the round robin. Then we will know our final pairings uh, for the quarterfinals. And that's all I have for you today. Get out of here.